John chapter 7, the Jewish people had three special feasts of times that every year they went back to Jerusalem. All the people came and they went to Jerusalem uh, for the Passover and then for Pentecost and uh, then in the fall uh, for the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, Jesus had been to this fe Feast of the Tabernacles and on the last day, notice please in verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And now Jesus is here giving an invitation to salvation. Uh, if you thirst, if you see the need in your life, I'm here to take care of that need. Uh, I'm the Savior. And so come to me and drink. And then he says, he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. The Holy Spirit came as a result of Jesus ascending back to glory, seated with the Father on the throne, and then he sent forth the Holy Spirit. Now, in John chapter 14 and verse 26, the Bible talks more, and these are the words of Jesus, and he said, but the Comforter. Now, he had identified him as the Comforter back in, in verse 17, but uh, he doesn't say he talks about the Holy Spirit, but in verse 26, the comforter. This is a wonderful word. This is one uh, that a word that means one called alongside of to help, to give encouragement to, to help, to strengthen, to bless. And so the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I'm going to send him the comforter to take the place that I have been to you for the last three years. Jesus had walked with the disciples. He was a companion with them. They could talk with him. He talked with them. Uh, and uh, they spent their time with him for almost three years now. But Jesus said, I'm going away. And they were very sad over that. And he said, let not your heart be troubled. And then he said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And then he tells them why they should not be troubled. And that is because there's a comforter coming. There's one who's going to be to you a wonderful comforter to all of the children of God, those who believe on Jesus or receive him as Savior. The comforter is given. And Jesus said, The comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, that's a wonderful promise. The Holy Spirit is going to give comfort, and he's going to give comfort. One of the ways he's going to do it is he's going to teach you all things. And that's a wonderful thing that we have. Jesus said, I've been a teacher to you. He taught them for three years. He taught them on the mountainside. He taught them by the lake. He taught them when he was in the ship. He taught them in the synagogues. He was teaching everywhere and preaching. And now he says, the Holy Spirit's going to come, and he's going to be your teacher. He's going to comfort you by teaching you the things of God. And then he's going to bring to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. And boy, that is a wonderful thing. Uh, some of us are getting a little age. We're over 50 now. And, and uh, I don't like the way you laughed about that. <laughs> but but uh, we have uh, sometimes a little shortness of memory. As like Brother Gerald said, he had a wonderful memory. It was just a little short. And, uh, and so we, we get that way. And uh, we need to depend upon the Holy Spirit because he said, I will bring to your remembrance whatever Jesus said. Isn't that marvelous? Because, you know, they must have been very fearful. Jesus is going away. And we will remember what he said to us. All those wonderful things that he said. All of those wonderful parables that he gave. And, and the encouragement that he gave. Will we remember those things? And Jesus said, the comforter is going to be here. And he's going to help you to remember everything that I have said. What a wonderful promise this is. Turn to chapter uh, uh, 15 and look at verse 26 in chapter 15. But when the Comforter, this is Jesus speaking, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. 
Now, the third thing the comforter is said to do to bring us comfort, to bring us encouragement, to lift us up when discouragement comes and when despair comes, and, and we become uh, those who are despondent, and that happens to almost everybody at one time or another. It's a thing that is a pandemic to all human race, the problems of getting discouraged and getting despondent from time to time. And so he said, this comforter, who is the Holy Spirit, he's going to do something wonderful. He said, he shall testify of me. Oh, how good that is. That is, uh, the Holy Spirit is going to testify of Jesus. He's going to tell you the things about Jesus. And he's going to say, remember what Jesus did when he came walking on the water in the middle of the night? And Peter will say, yeah, I remember that because I jumped out there on the water with him and I started walking too. Uh, but I got my eyes off Jesus and started to say, but he saved me. He reached down and lifted me up out of that water. And what a wonderful thing it was. And then Jesus, when the great storm, he stood up and said, peace, be still. And all the winds and the waves obeyed him. How wonderful it is. And the Holy Spirit's going to come and testify of Jesus. Now, the Holy Spirit didn't come to testify of himself. Did you notice that? When the Holy Spirit came, uh, he didn't come to talk about the Holy Spirit. He came to shine the spotlight on Jesus. He shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. You're going to be able to bear witness just like he is going to to bear witness. Now look over in chapter 16, and we'll begin reading uh, in uh, verse 5. He said, But now I go on my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. You mean these greatest Christians who ever lived, these disciples of the Lord who had been his, in his college for three years and had seen all these miracles, that sorrow could fill their heart. Uh, so don't feel too bad if sorrow gets into your heart from time to time. It's going to happen. Uh, and, and it happens to everyone from time to time. And so don't be, feel bad about that. But he said, sorrow has filled your heart. And, and then he said, uh, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. He always spoke the truth. It was impossible for him to say the thing, but, but the truth. And he said, I tell you the truth. It is expedient. It is to your great advantage. Is what is the meaning of the word. It is to your great advantage uh, for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, Jesus saying it is the greatest thing that could ever happen when the Holy Spirit comes to you. It is great. He is comparing it with his own ministry. And he's saying, it is expedient to your advantage if I go away and send the Holy Spirit. I mean, think about what that means to the child of God. That's a wonderful thing. Someone said, well, I would love to have walked on the shores of the Sea of Galilee with Jesus. I would have loved to hear him say, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I would have loved to heard Jesus say the things he said. Hey, Jesus said, it's better for you that I go away because you're going to have the Holy Spirit coming to you. Now watch what he says about the Holy Spirit. When he has come, he will reprove the world. Uh-oh. He's going to tell the world what's wrong with them. He's going to reprove them. And, and, and that means, uh, that doesn't mean saying, oh, God bless you, everything's well. Re reprove means you need to get some things straightened out. You know, there's some things that are crooked, and you need to make them straight. And he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Spirit now has a ministry, and that ministry is a ministry to bring salvation very clearly to everyone. You see, he said no one could come unto the Father except, uh, except the, the Holy Spirit would draw him. And Jesus said, when I, I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. The Holy Spirit is the one who has a wonderful ministry to us in our salvation. In fact, we wouldn't be saved if it hadn't been for the Holy Spirit. Now, you follow this through, 
Jesus said to Nicodemus, and you remember uh, what Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus has to said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water. You were carried in a sack of water for nine months, and you had the water broke, and you had the water birth. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Uh-oh. You've got to be born again. You've had one birth. That's not enough. You had one birth, a natural birth, gave you natural life, but you can't get into heaven with just your natural life. No matter how refined or how religious or how rich or poor or how educated or uneducated, it doesn't make any difference. If you just are depending on your life that you got from your natural birth, you will not go to heaven. That's what he said. So you have to be born again. Well, how can you be born again? He said, you must be born of water and of the Spirit. You see, it is the Holy Spirit who brings to you the life of Jesus when you trust him as your Savior. You see, the Bible said, this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And so the Holy Spirit brings to us the life of Christ, and we're born of the Spirit. It's a miracle. And that's why we say it is all of God. It's not something not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not something we could work up. and not something we could gin up by our own sincerity or our own works. Instead, it's the work of God. It's entirely the work of God. And we receive Christ and we trust Him. And the Spirit brings us everlasting life. Amen. We're born of the Spirit with life from above. How wonderful it is to be regenerated. Except you're born again, you will never get into heaven. And so that new birth comes when the Holy Spirit brings to you the life of Christ when you receive him as your Savior. But not only so, the Holy Spirit, at the moment you receive Christ, baptizes you into the body of Christ. This is a wonderful miracle. Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he says, But all Christians, all of you, have been baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Now, he pictures this as Christ being the head and every believer in the whole world of every race and every tribe and, and of country and nation in the whole world, everyone in the whole world who puts their faith in Jesus Christ and receives him as their only hope of heaven, those people are then immersed by the Spirit into the body of Christ. He's the head and every one of us are in the body. And you know, the miracle of that is that the life that's in the head is the life that's in the body. It's all the same. And, and we are members of him and members one of another. That's what he calls the church, the body of Christ. How wonderful. And the Holy Spirit's the one who baptizes us at the moment of salvation into the body of Christ. He immerses us into Christ. How wonderful that is. But not only so, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. And uh, our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, a temple is a place of worship. He, he didn't say a dwelling place. He had a temple. And a, and a temple is a place where you come and meet with God. And, and the Holy Spirit lives in your body if you're saved. Think about that. God is in you of a truth. And you think about it. He said, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? which you have of God, and you're not your own. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He's saying, beloved, the Spirit of God is in every believer. Wonderful. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you understand that the Holy Spirit is equal to God the Father and equal to God the Son, a member of the Holy Trinity? And all the power that God has, Jesus has, and all the power that Jesus has, the Holy Spirit has, and he lives in us. Well, whither shall I go from thy presence? <laughs> Nowhere. <laughs> Wherever I go, you're with me. 
Jesus is with me wherever I go. I cling to his promise, and this you can know. And if you'll take my Jesus as your Savior too, wherever you go, he'll be there with you. And the idea is he comes and dwells in us by the Holy Spirit. And so we are indwelt by the Spirit of God. Not only so, beloved, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And well, this is a marvelous truth. You know, he says to us that we receive Christ as Savior. We are baptized into the body. We are indwelt by the Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is a seal that guarantees that we'll forever be His. That nothing can ever take us away from the Lord. Had a guy in West Virginia, the Holy Land. He's in there. His wife had been saved and baptized, and she loved the Lord Jesus, but the husband not saved. And he had heard, but he had uh, not accepted, and so the preachers had gone by once and twice. And on this occasion, this preacher friend of mine, who's preached for us here, Bill Bartlett, he went by to see him. And uh, he got talking to him, and he was very serious about the matter of his salvation. He knew he needed to be saved. And so when Bill asked him, he said, Would you accept Christ? And he said, you know, I would, but he said, I know I could never live it. I couldn't live it. And Bill said, well, praise the Lord, you got the truth. It dawned on you, you surely couldn't live it. If you could live it, you don't need Jesus. You receive him and he lives his life in you. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so the Holy Spirit has himself become a seal and seals us into Christ. It guarantees our eternal salvation. You know what the Scripture said? He sealed us under the day of redemption. Now, your soul's been redeemed. Yeah, you know you're saved. You know, you're, you're washed and, and you're cleansed and your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life and you belong to God, uh, but your body's not redeemed yet. I hate to tell you that. It's just not. Not yet. It's just not. A and if you want to find that out, stub your toe in the dark. And you'll find out in a hurry that your body is not redeemed yet. Right. But there's coming a day when your body is also going to be redeemed. And we'll see him and we'll be made into his likeness. And we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. There'll be no more sickness or sorrow or pain or death. The former things are passed away. Amen. And all to the glory of God, your body is going to be redeemed. But did you know what he says? Watch what he says. The Holy Spirit has sealed us until the day of redemption. Yes. Whew! I'm so saved I can't get any more saved. <laughs> well, you think about that. Yeah, and the reality is I am sealed. I didn't save myself and I don't keep myself saved. I, it, by the way, if we had to keep ourselves saved... There wouldn't be anybody here next week. You'd all just be all lost and undone. Because we, we can't save ourselves and we can't keep ourselves saved. Yeah. I know that some of you are very intelligent and some are very spiritual. But the devil is smarter than you are. And the devil is stronger than you are. And if you had to keep yourself saved, you'd be in trouble. You really would. And so he seals us. He saved us and he keeps us. We are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit in our salvation. But then, you know, the work of the Holy Spirit continues as we serve the Lord Jesus. We have to have him in our service. Now, you see, he said, wherefore, be you not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is. I, I, I'm glad I'm not the Lord. Because I would look around and I'd see, are you wise? Are you wise? Are you? Be not unwise. 
but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And, and here is what he says. Listen to this. Now be wise. Don't be misunderstanding. Don't be like those who are out there in the dark. Wherefore, he saith unto you, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And then he tells you, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. God's people ought not to be imbibing in liquors or any, of any kind. I just don't believe that that's right. Somebody said to me one time, how, how many drinks does it take to get drunk? Not supposed to get drunk, right? How many drinks does it take? How, well, let's say it's 10. I don't know. Let's say it's 10. I've never tasted liquor, so I don't know. By the grace of God, I saved when I was 12 years old. Never tasted it. Hallelujah. I see the Lord Jesus without the taste in my mouth. Well, does that make me any better than you? No. <laughs> Some of you drank a lot of it. <laughs> but watch this. Be not drunk with wine. And I say, if it takes 10 drinks to make you drunk, you take one drink, you're one tenth drunk. <laughs> right? So stay away from that stuff. You don't need that. You need the Holy Spirit working. Watch what he said. Be not drunk with wine. Where does excess? The word excess means riotousness. It means, it means wickedness. It means a lack of self-control. But he said, be filled with the Spirit. Every child of God is given a command to be filled with the Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit lives in you, but uh, he wants to take complete control of you. And he allows you to run your own life or to yield to him and let him control your life. That's what it means to be controlled, to be filled with the Spirit. In Acts, he said they were filled with fear. That means that fear had complete control of them. Same word, he said, be filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit have complete control of you. And you yield yourself to his control. He lives in you. He wants to control you. And you say, Lord, here am I. Lead me. Guide me. Fill me. Use me. Make my life a blessing to those around me. That's what the Lord wants to do in every one of our lives. Be not drunk with wine, but is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute. Is that what he said? He said, the Spirit-filled life, be filled with the Spirit. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, for the husband's the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands and everything. Now, he did not say for a man to get a club and say to his wife, Now, listen, man. <laughs> this will get you in trouble. <laughs> but he didn't say for a man to say to his wife, Now, you're going to do what I say because I'm the boss around here. That's not in the Bible. You know what he said? He said, Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. Now, the spiritual wife will willingly submit to the leadership of her husband. That's what he's saying. Nowhere does it say to the husband, you've got to obey me. He says to the wife, you obey him. <laughs> Whoo! Well, we need some spiritual women in this world. And we've got a bunch of them around here, thankfully. But then he says, husbands, love your wives even as Christ Love the church and gave himself for it. A husband must be willing to lay his life down for his wife. And treat her with kindness, treat her with gentleness, treat her with love and, and understanding and be good to her and be kind because that's what Jesus is to his church. And a husband is to treat his wife just like Jesus treats the church. You see, that's a spirit-filled life and you can't do that on your own. Believe me, you just can't. But with his strength, the Holy Spirit, when you're in his control, well, that's just the way you live. That's the way he would have you to live. Did you know the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us victory over sin? Now, you still have a sinful nature. Even if you're the most sanctified, most, uh, mo most separated, most spirit-filled person in this room, 
you still have an old sinful nature that's dragging you down to sin. It's there. It's always there. It's continually there. And uh, that's called in the Bible the law of sin. That old sinful nature. Boy, wouldn't it be great if we could get rid of that thing? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be wonderful? Would you vote for that? Yeah, I'd vote for it in a second. Yeah, you would never have any problem with pride or fear or with the lust of the flesh or with anything. Anger, rag, ma malice, hatred, bitterness, unforgiveness. Hatred. All that would be gone. But that old flesh is still there. And just like D.L. Moody said, the greatest enemy that D.L. Moody has in this world is D.L. Moody. And I think every one of us who's honest, we'd say the same thing. The greatest enemy we have in this world is that old self, that old sinful self that's with us. But thanks be unto God, there's victory over the self life by yielding to the spirit. Because he said, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. There's victory in Christ. You see the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation and all those wonderful things in our Christian life. He's there also. He teaches us and guides us and fills us and, and makes intercession for us when we pray to the Father. And uh, our prayers are answered then. And then in the book of 1 John, he tells us the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the child, children of God. Do you know what that means? You have assurance of your salvation. Amen. You can know you're saved and, and know it and have no doubt whatsoever because the Spirit bears witness to your spirit that you belong to Him. You see, all the wonderful things the Holy Spirit does, and He will lead us, He will empower us, He will bless us, He will use us to the glory of God. Then our lives are really worthwhile in this old world. All right, let's pray right now. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? We're going to pray.